Okay, everybody, um, thank you so much for joining. Um, we might give it a few minutes just to make sure everybody's online, but I'm really happy to um, see all of you so far. I hope you were uh, either able to attend a session already or that you're um, planning to attend some upcoming sessions if they're in a better time zone for you. Um, I certainly know it's, it's a fair bit earlier in the day on the other side of the world from Australia where I am. So I um, appreciate you all coming along. So yeah, I'll give it another like minute or two, um, but then we'll get started. Um, if you're keen to chat or feel like you want to introduce yourself, feel free to um, put in the chat who you are and where you're joining us from. I'd love to see the different um, diversity and global representation that we've got going on. Thanks, Alex, for starting off the chat. Wonderful. We've got people from all over the world. I'm so excited. It's my absolute pleasure to um, be running this session uh, with you. And my hope is that at the end of the session, you'll be a little bit more familiar with doing some programming uh, with an open data cube implementation specifically for Digital Earth Africa. So we seem to be doing pretty well for people, um, in which case I might get started. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and just present a few slides um, to sort of introduce you to the workshop and a little bit of background. So thank you so much for coming along. Um, it's really great that you're here, that you're participating in the conference and that you've taken this opportunity to get to learn a little bit more about how we can, you know, how you could use the Open Data Cube uh, to analyze satellite imagery. Um, we're going to specifically be working with one of our open sandbox platforms. Um, I did send around an email earlier if you had pre-registered for this session with some instructions for signing up, but if you haven't yet, don't worry at all. We'll cover that as part of um, the 30 minute session that you have for uh, working uh, in a small group. So um, for this particular tutorial, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. I'm going to do a live demonstration of how to load. We're going to have 30 minutes to work through a tutorial again, which I sent around earlier, but again, I will share with you uh, when we get there. So if you're new to the Open Data Cube, I wanted to start by talking about the fact that it's a piece of open source software that's there to help you catalog and query um, specifically uh, raster data. So uh, images that come out of satellites, um, it's really great for that. And what it really is doing is that it's providing a method for you to say, here's where my data is located um, and here's how it's sort of sorted in time and here's uh, where it is on my file system. And then what that means is that you can query that database to just pull out the pixels and the imagery that you actually need and want to analyze. Um, and that's what the Open Data Cube enables you to do. So this is sort of well explained by um, these components. So we have the Open Data Cube as a whole, but it's sort of split into, you know, where the data is sitting and those are the actual, you know, let's say GeoTIFF files. Um, then there's the infrastructure, which is what's interfacing between the data and also the applications, which is how you're going to access the data. So when we set up open data cubes, we have to build this index database that says, 
here's where all my data lives. Either it lives in the cloud on S3, or it might live on your native file system. And once you've done that indexing, you can then use um, these sort of various apps like Jupyter Notebooks or web services to go and access the data that you need. But the indexing is pretty hard. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to use an implementation of the Open Data Cube that already has that index set up, specifically over whole, all of Africa. Um, and for this implementation, we're going to use um, Jupyter Notebooks. So this is an environment where you can um, write Python code section by section and um, see your results as you go. So I'm going to show you a little bit of what that looks like. Like I said, um, doing the index is the hard part of the Open Data Cube. And the reason these sandboxes are great, we not only have one for Digital Earth Africa, but one for Digital Earth Australia as well, is that the data is already there and you can just work straight with the Open Data Cube Python API to work with the data. The other thing that's great about the sandboxes that you might notice in the picture is they actually come with a whole bunch of reference notebooks, such as the beginner's guide, that you can use to learn about how to actually achieve certain things in the Open Data Cube, such as loading data or plotting it. So the goals for this workshop, um, you're going to find an area that looks interesting to you uh, somewhere in Africa. Uh, load a little bit of data for it. We won't load too much just because you only have a little bit of time and sometimes the loading can take a while. And then see if you can visualize it using the sort of um, standard RGB, red, green, blue imagery plot. If you are feeling ambitious, there's a scratch goal where you can take this data and calculate um, a satellite imagery uh, band index. So this might be something like the normalized difference vegetation index, which might tell you about the health of um, different field, uh, yeah, the different crops in these fields. So I'm gonna jump in now to doing a live demonstration. So here's the Digital Earth Africa sandbox. I've already logged in. Um, you can see here's these uh, existing folders uh, that are really useful. Um, and this is how we create a new notebook. Um, so I'm going to rename my notebook and call it ODC Workshop. So the great thing is, is that this sandbox is your space. When you leave and log back in, anything you put in here um, is unique to you. You have a copy of all these standard notebooks, but you can copy them and edit them as you desire and just make your own notebooks. Um, so now that we've got this, I'm actually gonna need to pick an area that looks double. So one of the easiest ways to do this is the Digital Earth Africa uh, maps interface. And the reason I really like this is that you get a really clear visual um, of the whole continent and you can sort of easily uh, look about where, uh, look where data is available and um, get the information that you're going to need in order to load it in the open data queue. So one of the nice features I think is that you can um, directly search. So this is pulled up Cairo. And I've zoomed in a little bit. At the moment, this is just a um, sort of background uh, imagery setting. But once that loads in, I'm gonna be able to use this as a sort of guide to find something interesting that I wanna look at. So here I'm gonna look at these irrigated fields. Okay. So the thing I can do now that's really helpful is that by clicking somewhere on the map, um, I can actually get some latitude and longitude coordinates. And these are what I'm gonna have to use to load my data. So what I'm actually gonna do is I'm going to copy those. And in my notebook, um, I'm going to change this. This is called a cell. I'm gonna change it to markdown. And this means I or plain text here that I can get back to later. Um, if I press shift enter, 
um, that actually just renders as plain text. So this is really good for keeping notes of things I'm going to need. So I'm actually going to make a note that when I did that click, I was sort of in the bottom left uh, corner of where I want to look. So I'm going to say bottom left uh, these coordinates. Perfect. So I can get rid of that. And now I can click up here. So that's going to be the top right. Again, I'm just going to copy those coordinates and pop them into here. So that is the top right. Awesome. Um, and I do want to mention that um, I, as part of that PDF, that you'll work through for most of the session. Um, I have instructions for you to follow for all of these steps. So um, there's no need to follow along live with me as I do this. Feel free to just pay attention and understand the different components that are involved in um, actually going and loading, uh, loading data. So now that I know whereabouts I want to load some data, I'm just going to put a break in there so I can see them a bit more clearly. Um, I can come back to my map and start exploring what data um, Digital Earth Africa has available. So there's a big explore map data button here and everything's nicely catalogued. So I'm going to look in satellite images. I want to look at surface reflectance. So that's what our uh, Earth looks like. And again, this is analysis ready data. So it's going to be straight uh, ready for us to work with. So I want to have a look at sort of changes on the order of months. So I'm going to go for the daily surface reflectance data rather than looking at the annual. I'm also going to add, um, I'm going to look at Sentinel-2 specifically because it's got that higher resolution and sort of a, a faster revisit time. So when I click that product um, in the DE Africa Maps interface, I get this really good um, sort of detailed information about the product. This is really worth reading if you're not familiar with these products. But right at the bottom, there's a piece of information I really need for the sandbox. And this is this what's called the layer name. So I'm going to copy that. Here it says S2 underscore L2A, and that stands for Sentinel-2 Level 2A. So that's the analysis ready data. So I'm going to come back to my notebook. I'm double clicking that cell to edit it. And I'm just going to make a note that says Sentinel-2 product name is this. Oh, um, you can directly add that data to the map. Um, and there's another good feature that will let you uh, specifically filter by location because Sentinel-2 specifically passes over uh, different parts of Africa each day. You won't always see satellite imagery um, in the location that you're looking at every day. However, if I change it to uh, filter by location, we see uh, the real imagery that was captured on these dates. So that can be a really nice heads up of, you know, are you looking at the data you actually want to analyze? So for me, I'm pretty happy with this. So now I can actually get started. So now that I have this information that I'm going to need, one of the best things you can do to help yourself is to go and look at the beginner's guide and look through the different notebooks we have um, for doing things. So I'm going to open the loading data um, notebook as a reference for myself. Just going to close this a little bit. Um, I love Jupyter Lab because I can just stick this notebook over here as a reference and I can keep working in my own notebook. So these notebooks have lots and lots of detail. Um, and they're really great as a reference guide. So one of the first things you can see is that when we're working with the Open Data Cube, you need to import the Open Data Cube um, Python package. So that's going to give you access to all the API. And you need to set up um, an object that's actually your connection to the, to the Digital Earth Africa Data Cube. So I'm going to start by import Data Cube. And you can see some of the color has come up because I'm actually working in a code cell. So when I press shift enter, that's all good. Um, this one on the side here means that that's finished running. 
And then in order to connect to the data cube, I'm going to call my data cube object DC. And the way that you call it is you write data cube dot data cube. So that's the data cube uh, object from the data cube library. Um, we tend to give it an app name and that's just to help us uh, understand um, all the different people that are using the data cube, but um, really we can call it anything. So I'm going to call it my notebook. And then that's enough to connect it. This uh, deprecation warning is coming up, but it's um, not something we need to be worried about. So sometimes when things come up in red, they might just be a warning. It's always worth uh, having a read of them. Okay. So I'm now looking at how to load data using DC load. Specifically, it will require at a minimum a product. So this is actually our Sentinel-2 level 2A product. Um, it requires the area I want to load uh, my sort of uh, X dimension, the area I want to load the Y dimension, um, and the time span over which I want to load it. And it tells you a little bit about how you need to provide the format there. So what I'm going to do is before I actually construct that load, I'm going to turn the data I collected into something that's a little bit more useful. So something that's great that I can do in Python is I can actually set up variables that mean something to me. So what I'm doing here is I'm typing bottom and left. So these are two variables. And here I'm going to just copy the latitude and longitude values that I collected earlier. So I know that that one is the bottom because it corresponds to degrees north. And I know that this one is the left because it's degrees east. And what that will do is when I evaluate that cell, this will say bottom is equal to 30.2 and left is equal to 30.5, obviously with the extra decimal points. So I can do this again for the top and the right equals. And then again, I'm going to use a bracket. This is called a tuple in Python. Um, and I'm going to copy and paste my coordinates straight in there. Perfect. So I'm going to say that my data product is equal to S2 underscore L2A. Um, I'm using quotes here because I need to pass this in as a string, so a word rather than a number. Um, and finally, the thing I hadn't decided is that I need to pick a start and an end date. So I'm going to call a new variable start date is equal to, um, I'm going to look at uh, 2020 and January and January 1st. Again, you pass this in as a string and you can see that um, that information is available in the loading data notebook. I'm just going to load um, two months worth of data just because I don't want us to be here too long. Um, and Sentinel-2 is data every three to five days. So two months should give me um, a reasonable amount of data to look at. Cool. So when I press Shift Enter, these variables are all assigned. If I type one of them and hit shift enter, you can see that Python will print out for me um, the value that's actually assigned to that. Um, so that's a good way to check if things are working the way you expect. I'm just gonna cut that cell because I don't need it anymore. Fantastic. Now we can start learning how to load data. So this is an example for the Geomedian Sentinel-2 product. Um, I'm going to use that as a basis and I'm going to add a couple of other things um, that have to do with loading Sentinel-2. So I'll need to assign my loaded data to a variable. So I'm going to call that DS. That stands for data set. You could really call this anything. You could say Sentinel-2. You could say, you know, March data set or anything you want to call it is fine. We tend to use DS and DS with underscores to kind of indicate that they're a data set. So here I'm using this DC object that we did earlier. That's my data cube and I'm asking it to load. So from here, 
I'm going to start inputting the information I need. So there's an argument called product. And I'm going to say that that's equal to my variable data product, which is the Sentinel level 2A. Um, then I'm going to say that my X uh, is equal to left comma right. And my Y is equal to, it doesn't really matter. I don't think whether you go top or bottom or bottom or top, but I'm going to go top and bottom. And then finally, I'm going to also put in time equals uh, start date and date. Um, you could also copy, you know, these numbers and these strings straight into here, like they are in, in this example. Um, I like using variables because you could come and edit these later if you wanted to change them. Um, another thing you'll see here is you need to specify which measurements you want. These are the sort of satellite imagery bands. So measurements equals, and for that we provide Python a list. So that's with the square brackets. So we use blue, green, uh, red. Um, I'm also gonna load near infrared. So that's NIR. And finally, there's a little extra bit that's required. Um, if I actually try and run this, it will give me an error. And that's because this product doesn't actually have a default uh, coordinate reference system. So it's telling me I have to specify the output CRS and the resolution as a part of my query. So I'm gonna come back up to my query and just add another line. So here's the output CRS. Um, I'm going to use uh, EPSG6933 for Sentinel-2. That's going to give me something back in meters. And then it also said I needed to specify the resolution. So in this case, what I'm going to write is negative 10, 10. And what that's saying is that each pixel is 10 meters. And it's just providing the information that um, the Y pixels uh, go down in space rather than from left to right. And they go top to bottom instead of bottom to top, uh, which is something it needs. So there is some more information about that in this uh, document if you want to look at it. So see how this has a little asterisk? That means it's loading, which is good. It does take a few seconds. Just double checking, I didn't accidentally load a huge amount of data, but it's done, which is great. So when I showed you before that you can just type in a variable and see what it looks like, we can do the same thing with our loaded data set. And what we actually get is something called an X-array data set. So what this tells you is that the data I've loaded actually has three dimensions. I've got 24 time steps. 656 X pixels and 414 Y pixels. Um, and it tells me that my So I could just look at one of those directly if I type the S dot red. And again, that's showing me the actual surface reflectance values that are sitting in there. So that's um, the introduction so far. Um, I would highly recommend that you um, also have a look at the plotting notebooks um, and the basic analysis notebooks if you are working through um, the PDF we uh, supplied to you uh, in the breakout rooms. So I'm gonna stop sharing for the moment. Um, and now it, is your turn. So what's going to happen now is for the next half an hour, um, you're going to be assigned to a breakout room, either with me or Andrew Hicks or Ife Chong or Alex Leaf. And we'll be there to um, answer your questions if you get stuck working through the tutorial. So the link to the tutorial, um, I'm gonna post it in the chat here, but each of your facilitators can post it to you again if you don't have it. Um, so yeah, so please feel free to just open the PDF and start working through it. 
your facilitators are there if you have questions or you want to know how to do something different. Um, and after half an hour, we'll all come back in here just to wrap up. Um, I hope you enjoy the workshop and uh, get to learn some things about loading and manipulating data. So, uh, Roshni, um, if you can open the breakout rooms, that'd be great. You might see your screen disappear as Roshni does this, but it will come back in a moment when you're loaded into the breakout room. So have a great time. Thanks. <laughs>